Good morning. I almost did it again. I almost forgot to put on my microphone. You know, I like take the mask off and then I forget to put it back on. But anyways, um, I'm excited for this morning. I just had an energy drink. I'm ready to go. Uh, And so I hope you guys are ready to come along with me, all right, because I'm excited. Um, I'm excited for what God is doing. I'm excited for what we have been seeing. I'm excited for what he is going to do in the future. I'm excited for our study in the book of Acts. Uh, so I'm going to pray for us this morning as we, as we turn to Acts chapter 15. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for, uh, God, just everything that you are and everything that you do. God, I'm so thankful that, that we are able to know you, that we were created to know you. God, that you made a way for us to know you, that there is a good news that in the midst of all of the problems and all of the issues, there is an answer. And God, we are so thankful that you have made a way for us to be saved. We're so thankful that we get you. And to, and to just stand and, and look at your majesty and your glory and to give all glory and honor to you. God, I pray that you would be with us this morning as we open up your word, and I pray that you would speak to us. God, I pray that we would hear from you. That is why we are here. And so, God, would your voice be clear to each of us? Would your voice stand out amongst all other voices? Would your truth override all of the untruths that are buying for our attention and our time and our, and our, and our worship and our devotion? And God, we lift up the church of our city this morning and everywhere that your word is proclaimed today. I pray that you would add unto your church, that you would speak truth through those that are bringing your word this morning and that you would speak directly to all of those who will hear. God, we love you. We give this time to you. And in Jesus' name, amen. Listen, you know what you can get a lot of today? It's very easy to get. Bad news, right? Right? All right, you turn on your TV, if you still have cable, bad news, right? You go on the computer, bad news. Get on your phone, bad news. Talk to somebody in public, guess what? Bad news. But you know what this is? You guys aren't ready. You know what this is? Good news. You were excited when I sat down an energy drink and then I held up my Bible. <laughs> this is good news. Right? And so we want good news. We need good news. In the midst of everything that is going on in our world, there is good news. There is a news that is worthy of life. There is a news that is worthy of proclamation. There is a news that is worthy of worship. And we're going to look at it this morning. So turn with me to Acts chapter 15 as we continue to walk through uh, the book of Acts. And chapter by chapter, verse by verse, we're to chapter 15. And we're going to try to go through the first 35 verses. We'll focus mostly on some of what is said here by Luke at the very beginning. But we want to see this good news. This is the greatest news that there is. And, and, and this news has to filter everything else that we know and everything else that we hear and all the other news that we can perceive and try to understand. It is the foundation for everything or everything else will be confusing. Everything else will pull us down. Everything else will seem like there is no hope. It will bring worry and anxiety into everything that we try to do because all the other news is telling us of all the other ways that you need to try to find what only God God can give you. And this is the greatest news. It's the news that brings life, and we desperately need it. Because I said already, and we've already all admitted, there is bad news. And, and it's not just what's going on in our culture today. We all have a problem. There's a reason that our culture is the way that it is. Every single one of us individually has a problem, and every single one of us, because of that, has, it lives in a culture that has problems. And, and listen, even that can be good news, because it's clarifying, isn't it? it? It allows me to know that something needs to be changed, that something isn't the way that it is, that I, I should be seeking an answer or a solution to the problem that I have. So it gives us this place to start. Something needs to be done. So in that sense, bad news is a little bit clarifying for us because we know something needs to be done. And and then we have a place to start, but it's very clear we've got problems. 
The world around us is not as it should be. Our own lives are not as, as they should be. We're constantly trying to become something better, and we're trying to look at the world around us and, and determine how can this be how we feel like it should be. And we're seeking solutions, and we're trying to make things better. Every single one of us seeks this throughout our lives, but we can't make things better, can we? It's not working out for us. Even in our individual lives, we set these standards and these goals and we can't ever reach them or get to them. And when we do, they don't actually satisfy. And then we look at the world around us and all of the problems that we see and everybody's got some sort of different solution that we should drive and we should pour our lives into, but those never seem to work either. In fact, it just kind of seems to build disunity around everything because somebody comes along or some party comes along or some ideal comes along or some movement comes along and says, this is what we need to do. And then some other group, person, party, movement comes along and goes, nah, that's not right. And all of our infinite wisdom and all of our understanding and all of our seeing of the problem, we believe that this is what we all need to do. And then everybody picks a side and the war continues. See, we have a problem, but it is very clear that we do not have the answers. We're not able to fix it. It's clarifying that we have a problem. It's clarifying that we know that we have a problem. We can know that we need a solution and we need to seek something, but in all of our seeking, all of our working, all of our doing, we continue to have pointed out to us that we do not have the solution in and of ourselves. We can't fix ourselves, and we cannot fix the world around us. But here's the good news. In the midst of all of the clarifying bad news that's pointed out from our very hearts because of our identity and creation being made in the image of God, we know that we long for more. We were created for more. And so the problem is, is clear all around us. And in the midst of the problem and our inability to solve it, God, the creator of all things, gives us an answer. He breaks into the world. And that is good news, is it not? See, I come in here every single week, and I, and I don't know if you bought it, uh, noticed this or not yet. There's one message with a whole bunch of different text and application. It's all about the gospel. Amen. And I come in here every Sunday, and I try to get you guys excited about the gospel. Because it's the foundation for everything else. And listen to me. It does not matter how much we talk about your marriage if it's not founded on the gospel. It doesn't matter how much we talk about the, the working in the community, the mission that we do, anything else, any program that we might be able to have, any friendship or relationship or work that we might be able to speak into from this stage or in any of the programs that we might have, if it's not all founded on the gospel. Like it's pointless if we don't get this. If I can get you excited about this through the power of the Holy Spirit, then, then you will begin to understand how that gospel plays out in your marriage. Without the six steps that you need to go and do so that you can have that better marriage, and then you find out that we're either really good at this and we can do all these things, and so we look at all these other marriages and think, why can't you just be like us? Or we're really bad at this and we can't do it, so maybe we shouldn't be doing this because pastor said if we do these six things, everything will be great. You know what you need in your marriage and your relationships and everything else in your life? Jesus. Amen. So I sensed there was a little bit of unexcitement about the gospel, and so let's, let's get back on to our text, all right? <laughs> we need the gospel truth. So when in the midst of all of the bad news, Jesus comes. And he doesn't just tell us a way or steps to do something so that we can right all of the wrongs and get back up to him and have community with him. But he actually comes and lives and dies for us, paying the penalty of our rebellion. That we walked away from him and that's where all of our problems come from. It's the foundation of every problem in ourselves and in our culture. And he comes and he does the work for us to be brought back into communion with God by his grace through faith. So the only thing we bring to the, the whole salvation thing is the sin that makes the gospel necessary. And then we place our faith in the reality that Christ has done all of the work. And then guess what? We begin to see that Jesus is the solution to every problem that we have and every problem that we see. And that is the greatest news. 
It is the most important thing that you can possibly understand in your life. It will set the tone for how you see everything else in your life and everything else around you. To define yourself and find your identity and your value and your worth and who you are in Jesus through his work and not your work for him. And then that begins to determine how you actually live. We say it all the time, who you are determines what you do. If your identity is in God's grace, then who you are is, is, is his son or his daughter and his work has made you everything that you were created to be positionally with God. You're absolutely set free from your sin and your rebellion and you are made his and you are made new and you are given a new heart and new desires and you can begin to walk in him out of joy and you begin to see his law and his will and his desire as the pathway to the freedom that he has purchased for you. See, this is what Christ does for us when we understand his grace and his work. And then that truth begins to play out in everything in our lives. And we can begin to love and we can begin to see healing in all things, in our own lives and in everything that we pursue and God calls us to do when we live in grace alone. So, so there's no better news than grace that while you were still sinners, while I was still a sinner, Christ died for us. And that he promises the Holy Spirit when we place our faith in him and that he will work in us and he will transform us and into his likeness and holiness to see joy and giving him glory. And in everything that we do, we are his and we find ourselves in him. And that begins to color and set the foundation for everything else that we do in life. But if we miss that truth, listen to me. If you miss that truth, then you are robbing the greatest news on planet earth of everything that makes it good. And you're tossing it in with all of the other bad news that you hear that's saying, worship me. I will satisfy. I will fulfill. I am what you're looking for. I am what you need. Didn't work. You just need more of me. All of that bad news that will never satisfy you, if you toss out the grace of Jesus Christ, you just make the best and greatest news just like the rest of the news. And listen, it is so easy to do. It's simple to do. We do it all the time, even as believers, but it's easy outside of placing faith in Christ to just have pride and ignore it and, and try to ignore the truth of Christ and find your own salvation in the world. It's the irreligious way to seek the, the, the solution to all of the problems that we know that we have. And it is a whole lot of work and it is exhausting and we never find satisfaction, but it's also easy as a, as a follower of Christ, isn't it? to take pride or try to control, try, try to kind of like, okay, I know I need Jesus, but I, surely I also have to do this. There's some way that I have to be able to define how well I'm doing, how good I'm doing, and how much God owes me and how much blessing I have coming to me because we want to try to control the solution to the problem and we can't control it. But we do it all the time. We try. We're so prone to think in our faith very religiously Okay, okay, yeah, I know that I need Jesus, so I prayed the prayer, and now what do I need to do? How can I be a good Christian? What do I need to do to be good? And if I had a dime for every time somebody asked me, hey, I understand the gospel, but now, pastor, just tell me what I need to go and do. Just, just tell me, and I'm like, you don't understand the gospel at all. But I hear it all the time. Just tell me what I need to do. Give me the six steps. Like that's all I need to hear. And then I can leave this place. I can do those things. I'll be good with God. I'll be good with the church community. So what do I need to do to gain approval? How can I be a good Christian? How do I please God? How do I get his blessing? What are the six steps? And it just strips the greatest news. And I want us to understand this. It takes the greatest news on planet earth that is the solution to every problem that we have and the joy that we have in giving God glory for the fact that he has done all the work for us to have salvation and life and have it abundantly and eternity with him as we were created to have. And we strip it of everything that makes it good. 
See, this is the good news. It is the greatest news. But if we misplace or misunderstand what God is doing and offering and what he has done for us, then it becomes just like every other bit of news. It's not good. And it might excite us at first and challenge us at first and we pursue it at first, but we will realize that this was just good advice. It wasn't good news. It was just something for me to pursue. It wasn't something that was done. It cannot, listen to me, nothing but the grace of God can actually make the promise that you will find everything you're looking for in it. Because it's the only thing that's finished. It's done. And so this is the greatest news, but it's so easy for us to walk away from. And so I really need us to understand this before we look at this text, because this is what we're going to see here. And it's so easy for us to try to add something to the grace of God and try to pursue salvation in and of ourselves. And here's what happened. Christianity becomes a list of do's and don'ts, rules and regulations, It just kind of becomes this law to us that we don't understand all of these decrees that we have to live into. And and here's what we try to do. We try to make the gospel truth a two-way street like everything else in life. Mm, If I do this really good, then God will do that. If I work really hard, I'll get the promotion. If I study really hard, I'll get the grades. And so certainly God is just like that. And so I'll just do everything that I'm supposed to do in this Christian world, and then God will give me salvation because I will deserve it. Listen, which causes a whole lot of people to walk away. And I talk to people all the time in our community who tell me that when they hear that I'm a pastor and I start talking about Jesus, that they have already tried Jesus and it didn't work. They grew up in the church and that didn't work for me. And what I want to say, and I don't because God is growing me in grace and love, is that you did not try Jesus. Like you tried some kind of religious activity, but you didn't try Jesus because Jesus has already done everything for you. And so you don't go and do to become, but you do out of who you are. See, it becomes a joy for us to walk in the Lord. Not a chore. But it so easily becomes the chore, doesn't it? Because it's just a list of rules. And then some of us, as I said, we're really good at the rules. So we nail the rules. And that's where church becomes very judgmental, kind of becomes the social club. We we kind of become self-righteous. And then we just miss the point. The world misses the point when they look at the church, which we're supposed to be revealing the kingdom of God in. So they go, I tried that, didn't work. And the church is missing the point because we're, we're overstepping God's grace and trying to help God do what only he can do. So I can't tell you how many people have been baptized here. The vast majority of people, adults, over the age of 25, who have told me, well, I, I grew up in church, but I never think that I really understood the gospel. I just thought that it was something that I live morally and I please God, and I try to be a good person, and I prayed a prayer, but there's no actual salvation. There's no actual uh, lordship. There's no actual transformation, and it's taught so often. Listen, I even had an experience with it this week, so I really want to drill down into this so we can kind of begin to discover where our own hearts are, because I'm sitting in a very respected, I love this Christian organization in our city. I'm sitting here, I'm listening to this message, and, and, and basically what I got out of it was, um, I don't need to do this so that this won't happen to me, and I won't have to repent for it, and I'll be good with God. And I just sat there and I was like, uh, I don't think this is very freeing. I don't think this is the gospel truth at all. I think this just put a weight on me that I cannot bear. And, and what essentially just happened is you just ruined the good news for everyone who runs with what you just said. You just put a burden on everybody that they cannot handle or bear. Because only Christ can bear that for them. And so you needed to lead with the truth of the gospel and that in Christ we are able to do this in freedom and joy so that we can glorify him and know him and have life in him and reveal him. And therefore, we desire to do what you're saying we should do so that we don't get in trouble. 
It happens all the time. And we can't handle that. We will fail. We must understand that our salvation, our life, our eternity is, is in the work of Christ and not our own activity. But we have this great propensity in the church to live and to teach Christianity in such a way that it is on us. That it's on your performance. And here's what drives the results when we do that. Guilt, fear, shame, control becomes legalistic. And it is absolutely enslaving. There's no freedom in it. Because only God's grace has the power to transform us into his likeness. We cannot become like him or close to him by our work. His grace transforms. Martin Luther said that only grace makes disciples. Because only his grace transforms us into his likeness through his work and not our work on our own behalf, trying to get to him. And so the gospel is actually freeing. It, it gives us new desires. It changes our hearts and our longings and gives us joy in walking in God. So anything else that we build our life on is a waste of time. It's a worthless pursuit. It, it is like building everything that you desire in life on sand, and it will not be able to stand. Only God's grace builds your life on the foundation of what you were created to be and understand and to know and allows you to live for his glory and to reveal him in all that you do and have the joy that you were created to have in that community with him. But if you miss that, then the walls of your life will not stand. The foundation will crack. It will be like sand. The ceiling will fall in. And if we do that as a church, then we make this house unusable. See, the gospel must be the foundation of everything this text. So I know I took a long time to get here, but it was important because in this text, we have a pivotal, pivotal moment in the life of the church. Will the early church remain founded on the gospel truth or will we add something to Jesus that we need to become and that will be the future of the church? Do we need to be a part in the gospel or does Christ do it all when he said it's finished? That's what we see here and so it's pivotal. And so listen, I know that as I say that, I'm saying it to the nine o'clock crowd. I know that for most of you, you would say, I believe that. Salvation, grace alone, through faith alone, I get it. But so often the application of what we know and living it out in our lives, the transformation of our heart are miles away. Miles away. And so I want us to consider this this morning. Is the gospel good news to me that transforms my heart to live in the identity of Christ that he has purchased for me? Or is it just true news that I try my best to live into? Because see, that's where most of us are going to be. Is it good news that transforms my heart from the inside out, that defines everything that I do as the foundation of my life? Or is it just true? I believe it, and I'm striving with all of my power to try harder to do better in it. Is that where we are, or is it by grace? Look at verse uh, 1 of chapter 15. Barnabas and Paul ha have gone the, on this missionary journey 500 miles. They're coming back to Antioch from the trip. But during this time, but some, while well, Paul and Barnabas are gone, came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised or unless you become Jewish or unless you believe in our traditions or unless you practice our rituals, according to the customs of Moses, you cannot be saved. So here's the problem. Everywhere that Paul and Barnabas are going, scholars say these men were trying to go and do some cleanup in all of these cities. So all of these people were coming to faith by grace alone. Their hearts were being transformed. The church is exploding and multiplying. And they're coming back behind Paul and Barnabas and going, uh, yeah, you need Jesus, but plus this. Plus this, if you really want to be saved, if you really want to walk in Christ, if you really want to be a part of the church. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate. I love how Luke continues to say stuff like that. 
Like, try that in your house. Kids, this is no small mess. Clean it up, right? Like, he just, I love the way he describes things. And so he says they had no small debate. In fact, Paul, this is, this is the time that he wrote the book of Galatians, which addresses all of this. And so there was no small debate on this because it's a gospel essential. So Paul and Barnabas, some of the others, were appointed to go to Jerusalem to the, the council of the church with the apostles and the elders about this question. So pivotal moment. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversations with the Gentiles that they had been having. And it brought great joy to all the brothers. So the church that understands grace, lots of excitement. Woo! God is working. He is saving. Look what he's doing. Look how he's transforming. Verse 4. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they declared all the good that God had done with them. But some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, It is necessary to circumcise them in order, uh, and to order them to keep the laws of Moses. Let's stop right there for just a second. Here we go. And, and all of us have this, this in our heart. There, there's a problem and a propensity in our own rebellion and sin to want to be our own God or to take some sort of control out of pride, to not humbly live in the reality that Christ has done all the work for us. So, so don't read this and think, how dare they? Because I know we're all gospel people in here, but we also have the propensity in our own hearts to, to make declarations on our own lives and the other lives of others just like this. So we see this problem, and then there's this discussion and a decision and then an application. We'll go through it really quickly. Paul and Barnabas have come back from their missionary trip, this 500-mile trip that they've gone on. People have been coming to faith. And so these men go behind them because they're, they're, they're trying to help, right? I think they're good intended in what they're doing. And I think just like maybe a, a parent or something who really desires for their kid to live a moral life, like they try to drive morality in them by fear, try to control them, and, and try to say, this is what you have to do to, to walk in God. And, and, and it's really good intended. I catch myself doing it all the time. Then I got to tell my kids the gospel after I tell my own heart the gospel again, over and over and over. So it's something we all fall into. So I think they have good intentions here, and we'll see why in just a second. But they're trying to clean up. They're like, okay, yeah, Jesus, you need Jesus, but plus this, the law of Moses, plus our traditions, and plus these rituals. So you need all of these things after Paul and Barnabas have shared the gospel of grace. So they're doing this little bit of, yeah, 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 Jesus, but then you also need to do all of these things to actually be in his kingdom, which to be fair, as I said, was the way that it worked in the Old Testament. So if a Gentile was going to come to faith and be a part of the people of God in the Old Testament, they would go through all of the rituals. They would go through all the traditions. They would live the life with the Jewish people. They would essentially become Jewish because the people, the Jewish people were the people of God. So a Gentile could come in, but they would participate in the traditions and the laws and, and all of the rituals in the old covenant. So, so in their thought, in their process of thinking through this, they're just thinking, okay, well, let's go and help them out. But we know that when Jesus comes, he fulfills, as we talked about several weeks ago, the law. He fulfills the ceremonial law. He fulfills all of that through us, through his death and resurrection. So no longer do we have to live in certain traditions and rituals ceremonially. So he's not talking about the moral law. We still live in the moral law. So Paul and Barnabas were not going around saying, hey, by grace you are saved and then do whatever you want. Right? Like Paul writes about this a lot. Because grace actually transforms our heart when we have an understanding of it. So we desire Christ. We desire holiness. We desire to reveal him. We long for it. It's where we find life. So we dive in with all that we are, just like we pursue life in other things. So you have a hobby, something you like, something you really, really think that you need to give you the life that you think that you need to have and want to have. You dive into it with reckless abandon, don't you? It's just, it becomes you, it consumes you, and you're telling everybody about it. So when we understand grace, the reason that we do that in the world is because God created us to do that for him and with him. And when we understand grace, we dive in with reckless abandon. It's who we are. It defines us. We want more and more of Christ. And so they're not saying that we don't live in the moral law. This is all about the ceremonial law. It's about the ritual law. 
And so they're coming back and they're going, okay, this is how it's always been. So this must be the way that it needs to be now. But we talked several weeks ago that Christ has already fulfilled this. So we live in the moral law for freedom, but we don't live under the moral law to gain something that we don't already have. So everything that we do is a fruit of who we are when we're in Christ. And this is how we have to understand the law. To the unbeliever, the law is a tutor. It reveals, it spotlights, if you will, the fact that we have a problem. It's clarifying. And then it gives us the solution. It points to Christ. If we are are a follower of Christ, then it spotlights the fact that we constantly need to look back to the cross and the resurrection. That's why discipleship here, if you're an unbeliever, we're pointing you to the cross and the resurrection. If you're a believer, we're pointing you back to the cross and the resurrection. Defines everything that we are. We're leaning into who Christ has, what Christ has done and who we are in him. And so we see this, that, that the law then becomes the pathway, as I said, to our freedom. So Paul and Barnabas are not teaching that you don't live in the moral law. I want to make that very clear. When we place our faith in Christ, we desire holiness. We desire his, to be like him. We desire to glorify him in everything that we do. We don't want to dishonor him because it brings dissension between us and him. We want to be close to him. So when we sin against him, we repent quickly, not for our salvation or to regain salvation, but to, to be close to him because we desire and long to be in community with him deeper and deeper. But if we're outside of Christ, then the law points out that we need to repent and, and, and find salvation where salvation alone is in Christ. So Paul and Barnabas are teaching to live in and for the glory of God, but they're coming along and saying, you also need this. So think of it like this. It's kind of like uh, some of you might have like a storm door on your front door at your house. Um, and some places around the world or some communities, there's like a little compartment. And so like you open one door and you kind of walk into it so you can kind of get out of snow and all this kind of stuff. And then you, it's just big enough for you to open the next door to get in. So, so here's what the, the Jewish, these Jewish men are saying, that to be a Jew, to live in our traditions and our rituals, that's the storm door to get to the door. So you need to open this door, walk in, participate, change, clean up, become like us, and then the door of the gospel truth in Jesus Christ will be open to you. That's basically what's happening. Now, we do it all the time. We have a tendency for this, not only in our own life to think, what do I need to do to open this door so that I can open this door of blessing in God? And so we constantly think and fight like this in our own heart and mind. But then we also think of this in our community. This person, that person, they can't be doing that. They need to clean up. They need to change. They need to transform. And then they can be one of us. Right? So we all struggle with this because here's what happens. We think that people need to clean up, not necessarily to get to God, but to be one of us. It's basically what's happening. And so it's a misunderstanding of the grace of God and, and how it's his grace defines us and levels the playing field so that we become brothers and sisters with all of his people and we're able to love and sacrifice and give to all of the people that God has created in the image of God for his glory and to reveal him. And, and we, have, we fight this pride to define ourselves by who we are and what we do. And when that happens, we want to be in community with people like us, not like God. And so here's what happens. We want people to clean up to become one of us because when grace is not the foundation for everything, then we have to think that what we do is normative. How we do it's normative. That, that this is the right way to do it in our own culture, in our own tradition, in our own personal preferences. And so we start pushing those on to everybody else. Because if everybody's not participating in this to get to Christ, then that must mean that what I'm doing is my preference and not something that actually gets me in deeper community with God. So resting in his grace doesn't get me deeper in a desire to walk in him, but walking in him gets me deeper. And, and therefore, I can look at everybody else and go, okay, I'm doing a little bit better than everybody else. My culture is the right way to do it. My traditions are the right way. My personal preferences are the right way. Here's the problem with that. Jesus says, John 10, 7, I am the door. I am the way of eternal life. That nobody comes to the Father but by 
me. And then there's no other qualifier. He, he doesn't give us any and do this. So I, I'm the door, but do this first. Become like this, do that. No, it's just, I am the door. So, so we have to make clear that we do walk in holiness because of our love and transformation in the gospel and the Holy Spirit working through us, but we don't walk in holiness to become something we already aren't in him. We have to understand that at a very deep level. And this is the debate. And they have no small dissension on it. They, they want to honor God and they want to know the truth and they want to have the truth and love. And so this is what we see in the text. They have this debate and then something Paul and Barnabas are willing to battle on this. I, I've already quoted Martin Luther, but this just came to mind. Martin Luther said that Paul was like a reed when it came to the non-essentials in a river. He would just kind of, okay, let's bend with this and let's do this. But when it came to the essentials of the gospel, what we would call here a close-handed issue of the gospel truth, he was like an iron gate. So see, Paul is saying, this is an iron gate issue. Because if we lose this, we lose everything. The foundation is sand. So this is not a non-essential. This is a essential. So it's worth us standing up for. And so anything that's close-handed, the gospel truth that makes it what it is, something that God's word says extremely clearly for us, guess what? We'll stand on like an iron gate. If it's personal preference, tradition, then okay, we can kind of, you know, we're reading through this river. All right? Because, because what's essential is the gospel, and then we have unity in the gospel, which we'll see in just a couple of minutes. But they have this debate, and, and so they're like, we need to settle this thing once and for all. Let's go to Jerusalem. So they're sent to Jerusalem, and then we have what's called in history the Jerusalem Council. This is where the discussion is going to happen, and four people speak up, all representing the gospel. God is sovereign over everything. He has a plan in everything. He wants to make this extremely clear for the church. And so everybody that speaks, speaks on behalf of the gospel. And I love that they have this dissension. And listen to me, they do not split. They go to the word of God. And so there's a disagreement. We believe we have to live in these traditions. Nope. We believe that you have to live in the grace, by grace alone through faith. And they're going, well, what does God have to say? And then when they discover what God's word says, they move together and rejoice. I love that. See, a gospel people might have different preferences, but they always go to the word of God. And the word of God wins. And then we walk in unity. Why? Because we base our unity on the essentials of the gospel. So Peter speaks up, Paul and Barnabas speak up, and Jane speaks up on behalf of the church, and look with me really quickly, verses 6 through 13, says this, And the apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider this matter. And after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the gospel and believe. You remember Cornelius? So God went through a lot of work to open up the, the eyes of Peter to the Gentile people being saved by grace, just as the Israelite people are. And he says, and God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did us. So he's like, God's already done this. What's the debate on? Like, we can't decide now if what God has already done is okay. Like, God's already done it. I love Peter. And then he says something else that's even better. And he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. He's like, so they still ate steak, but they were praying to God and thanking him for it because they had circumcised hearts. They had new hearts. They had new desires. Verse 10. Now, therefore, why are you putting to the test, God to the test, by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we to bear. Why are we holding them to something we can't even do? Right? And we all do this. We all have rules that we don't have to follow. Grace for us, rules for you. Right? We want everybody else to live in our law, but we don't have to. That's kind of what they're doing here, and it's what we tend to do in the gospel. But, verse 11, we believe that we will be saved. I love this. I love this. We believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord, 
just as they will. Now that's something super special right there. And all the assembly fell silent. And they listened to Barnabas and Paul and they related what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. After they finished speaking, James replied, and this is James, the brother of Jesus, brothers, listen to me. Now Paul's right there. We'll summarize the rest of it in, in our last couple of minutes together. But these are the four people speaking into this. All right, Peter, Paul, Barnabas, and James. So Peter stands up and he goes, hey, listen, God clearly revealed that the Gentiles are, are a part of his plan, that all people from every tribe, tongue, and language are a part of his plan, that all people can be saved by his grace. And, he, and the Holy Spirit fell on Cornelius and his family and his friends, and the gospel multiplied. The church has grown, and Antioch is the first sending church, all Gentile people. So, so God is moving amongst the Gentiles, it's already happening. The Holy Spirit is clearly moving, and we all agreed on that. We all agreed that God was moving in them, and I did not preach to them, here's what you have to do to be saved, other than placing your faith in the work of Jesus Christ. So I didn't say, you gotta, you gotta stop eating the meat. I didn't say, you have to start participating in the festivals of your city. I didn't say that you need to change. I simply said, this is what Jesus has done. And they placed their faith in him and the spirit fell. And then transformation happened. Then discipleship began. And they began to move and the church has begun to grow. And then his second point, as I said, is even better. He's like, and, and, and secondly, we're putting stuff on them that we can't even do. Not only us, nobody ever has. Like God gave this law to the Israelite people and none of us have been able to do it. So I love verse 11. It's my favorite. Highlight it in your Bible if you do that. And if you don't, you should highlight in your Bible. He says, hey, Pharisees, you believe that the Gentiles have been saved or should be saved the way that you have been saved so that they can only be saved by doing what you do and becoming one of you. But here's the beauty of verse 11. But what makes Jesus the best news in all of eternity is that you can actually be saved, Israelite people, like the Gentiles have been saved by grace through faith alone. So he's like, you're getting it wrong here. You want them to be saved like you by doing what you think they need to do by your tradition, but you can actually be saved the way that God has saved them. So they're on this theological high horse and Peter's just like, no, they actually have the right theology. And you too can repent and be saved like them. Boom, like I love that, right? That's a mic drop moment, all right? That's what he does. Can you imagine, and I know I need to, Whatever, I'm not going to say I need to hurry up. We're talking about Jesus, all right? But can you imagine if you grew up in the church your entire life? You followed all of the rules. You've done everything that you think you need to do to be saved. Like this reminds me of the rich young ruler moment. I've done it all. What do I need to do? Well, you're just not following me, right? I've done everything. And so I'm a good person. I'm, I'm doing what God is calling me to do. And then we kind of have this idea of going around and kind of looking at everybody else and thinking, well, yeah, you know, if they were going to become one of us, they would have to change a little bit. They would have to do these things and kind of clean all this up, right, before they could become a Christian or become a part of our church. And certainly we think this way. There's certain people that could walk into here and we would kind of think, oh, man, they need to do a little bit of work before they belong, right? Let, let me make it really personal. What about this, just, just to kind of help us here, because we do believe and we're, we get excited about every man, woman, and child knowing and hearing the gospel and having an opportunity to respond, right? Right? Yes. yes. Okay. You're still awake. You're still with me. That's good. All right. What if a Muslim couple came to faith and, and came to church and started coming to church, which I would absolutely love, by the way. I know there's not a large population here, but there are some and they need Jesus. So I would absolutely love that. I had a, a, a ton, I worked a ton with the Muslim community in Orlando at the University of Central Florida, massive Muslim community, and got to go and speak to them on several different occasions with imams and, um, and rabbis. 
right? Trying to, trying to talk about the, the similarities and differences. And, and I love getting to Abraham because it's like, here's the difference where yours goes from good advice and mine becomes good news, right? So I would, I would love for a Muslim couple to come to faith. But what if they came to faith and then came to church and they loved Christ and they want to honor him and we get really excited, but then all of a sudden we have to answer the question, what do they do with all their customs? Like, like how does it make us feel when they come in here dressed the same way they would if they were going to the mosque? What if in their heart of hearts they want to glorify and honor God by taking their shoes off? What if they find it weird for the husband and wife to be in here together and so the wife stays in the lobby? Now there's some learning that needs to happen there, but then we're looking at this custom of, man, they're still praying five times a day. Now they're just going towards Jerusalem or something, right? They're still dressed the same. They're a little out of place here. He's in here. She's out there. He, he's coming up and talking to me about why there are other women in here. Now, he loves Jesus, he's trying, he's glorifying him, he's learning, he's reading scripture, but he's got a whole lot of different customs, and we might have a tendency to look at that and think to ourselves, I thought they were Christians. Like, why are they still participating in all those other things? Why are they praying like that, dressing like that, doing those things? Right? Why did they not become like us? Why are they not falling into the American Christian culture? Are they really saved? All right, we might start questioning their salvation because we might be allowing the culture to define a little bit of our gospel. Right, it happens all the time in the church, but only scripture can define the gospel. This is what the Jews and the Gentiles were doing. And so Peter comes in and goes, we can't live up to this law, and they have all these things, and God's already saved Cornelius. And, and suddenly he says, you can be saved just like them. Isn't that great news? And they just fall silent. And so Barnabas and, and Paul, they get up and they go, they give testimony to everything that God has done to fulfill the Old Testament prophecy, that all people will come to faith. And then James comes in, and he reminds them of the prophecy. So Paul and Barnabas, they give testimony to what God is doing to fulfill the prophecy. James, as the leader of the Jerusalem church, stands up and goes, hey, remember in the book of Amos? Remember in Jeremiah? God told us this has always been the plan, that he would always bring people from every tribe and tongue and nation to be his people and we are becoming his people together as the grace of God saves. And again, all the council, verse 22, they agree and rejoice. Like, you know what? We were wrong. The gospel is clear. Scripture is clear. The Holy Spirit is clear. Like God is moving in this way and we want to be on board with what God is doing. So they don't let their preferences and traditions get in the way of that. They, they rejoice in this decision. So the theology is set, and here's where I want to close. Last 60 seconds. They still have a problem. Theology is solved, but how do they have unity? Because they still have different traditions, and there's a whole lot of things the Gentiles are doing that, that the Jewish people would feel like defiles them. How do we worship together? How do we share meals together? How do we have unity? Are we just supposed to believe in Jesus and think, that's great, you do your thing over there, we'll do our thing over here? Or is there beauty in being brought together as one as we will be in the kingdom of God? So there's a problem here. They need to figure out this, these difference of opinions and preferences and traditions and cultures. And so in verses 19 through 21, James says, let's write a letter to the Gentile church so that they'll know these four things that they need to kind of watch out for. And it's crazy because it's like, James is like, we can only be saved by grace through faith alone, not by ritual. And then he writes a letter with four rituals for the Gentiles to follow. Right? And you're like, what is going on here? And so we see these four rituals that he tells them. And, and what's happening here is that they're not, again, talking about anything of the moral law of God, but the traditions and preferences and rituals. So the examples that he gives are things that they eat, things that were sacrificed to idols. The Gentile cities had all of these uh, religious festivals that would have a lot of sexual immorality at them. And some of the believers would, would not participate in sexual immorality, but they would be a part of the festivals in some ways. Right? Maybe they're selling Bibles at the, I don't know. But they would be a part of it in some kind of way. And so he's like, you need to stay away from these things. And what's happening here, and here's what I want to point out, 
is just what Paul would write about in 1 Corinthians 8 and 9. Just as the Jews cannot force traditions and preferences on the Gentiles, grace alone saves, the Gentiles cannot use their freedoms in the gospel to cause disunity in the body either. See, it's, we cannot drive salvation by tradition and works, but we also cannot drive salvation by, by using our freedom to call someone else to stumble. Truth always comes in love. And to have unity in the body, we, we, we have unity on the essentials, the gospel. And, and then we are able to build out that. Now, there might be some hard conversations, there might be some changing. Some people are like, eh, this is kind of just a tradition. I need to come this way a little bit. And maybe I'm taking this grace thing a little, this freedom a little too far. I need to come this way a little bit. So conversations can happen, but those things should not cause disunity. And this is what James is pointing out. So in Christ, we are willing to lay down our rights and preferences for our brothers and sisters good. And I want us to think about that. It's modeled after Jesus. It's what he does for us. So instead of you having to do this for me because I've got this freedom or you having to do this for me because this is my tradition, we look at the gospel truth and we have the posture of what can I do for you? How do I help both of us understand the gospel truth and grow in truth and love? So the posture that we take in Christ is, is there anything I can do? Because I love you. I want what's best for you. I'm for you. So if I'm doing anything that would cause you to stumble, then I will not do that. I don't care if I have the freedom to do it or not. I'm not going to cause my brother. Because there's something greater to live for than anything on planet earth, any freedom that we have, or any joy that we get out of any of God's creation. And it's the glory of God, the unity of the body growing in him and who he is. And so they're willing to give up anything that would cause their brother to stumble. So the traditionalists are going, nope, grace alone. The freedom people are going, I'm not going to cause anybody to stumble. And now we have the beauty of the gospel breaking into the church and bringing unity. It's incredible what happens here. We're a part of the family, so we love one another. Look what happens, verse 31. The Gentiles read it, and they understood through the lens of the gospel truth, and they rejoice. So all the church agrees, yep, grace alone, and then all the Gentile church agrees, yep, we need to forfeit some freedoms for the sake of unity in the gospel truth. And they continue to grow in the word, it says. What is God's word? So they just keep going back to God's word. Over and over, that drives everything that they do. So listen to me here. We're not holding up to you today rules. We're holding up to you grace that will transform your life. We're holding up to you the truth of what Christ has already done. And that will set the foundation for everything that you do in life. We will continue to grow. We will continue to see unity in him. We will reveal his grace and love and the truth of God to all people and in everything we do. And the church will multiply. God, thank you.